people are now doing this game of actually going around trying to find sets of stars that all have identical chemical fingerprints because that's really probably a sign that they at least originally all formed in the same place. So seeing where they've got to now then tells us something about their subsequent evolution. The interesting thing is that the science going on in all the globular clusters, you know, people are studying them, trying to figure out what's going on in them, whether they're different, whether they're the same and so on. So there's a, a nice paper came out uh, a little while ago by Judith Cohen at the Palomar Observatory, who was actually taking the light from the stars that this globular cluster is made up of and breaking them up into a spectrum, so splitting them up into the colours of the rainbow, and then looking for the little dark bands that are the absorption by different chemical elements and using those dark absorption features as a way of figuring out how much of the different chemical elements there are in these particular stars. She was looking at a particular set of chemical elements called rare earths, and she studied a bunch of different absorption lines due to different chemical uh, features. So there were some due to yttrium, barium, uh, europium and lanthanum, which are all, I believe, rare earth things, but you'd have to ask a chemist, not really my department. www.periodicvideos.com <laughs> But the interesting thing she found is they actually all had the same heavy element abundances, so they all had the same fingerprint in that sense. Finding the same fingerprint in all these things means they're all basically, in some sense, identical twins. And in this context, that just means that they were all formed from the same gas. And therefore, when it then split up to form the individual stars, that was kind of preserved in the stars. Other stars close to the Sun don't share exactly the same fingerprint um, because they're not in this same position of all being formed from a single blob of gas. So actually the stars around the sun were formed in rather different environments and so they have these subtly different fingerprints. So there's two interesting things that come from finding out this chemical fingerprint. Firstly, the fact that these heavy elements are there at all tells you that the stuff that this globular cluster was made of is not the primordial stuff of the universe because the Big Bang made hydrogen and helium and little bits of other elements, but it certainly didn't make any of these heavy elements. So the fact these heavy elements were there in the gas from which this globular cluster formed tells you that the material that that globular cluster was made of must have been through at least one previous generation of stars. There must have been earlier stars which somehow spat out these heavier elements that then sort of contaminated this gas and put some of these heavy elements in it. So it tells us that even though globular clusters, which we think of as some of the oldest things that we know about in the universe, they weren't the first sets of stars that formed. There must have been a previous generation of stars that produced these heavy elements that we see in them. So people are looking for this sort of first generation of stars that were made from completely uncontaminated, pure stuff left over from the Big Bang. And they're called uh, population three stars by astronomers because the youngest stars, the most recent generation of stars, are called population one stars. Uh, stars like those in the globular clusters are called population two stars. And then this primordial generation that must come before the globular cluster stars are called population three stars. So people have been hunting for them high and low and no one's ever found one yet. You'd look for places where not much has gone on for many billions of years because anything that did happen there probably happened very early in the lifetime of the universe and nothing subsequent will have happened to really mess it up. So you look in the outer halo of galaxies and so on, places like that, to try and find um, stars which have just been, would have been left alone since the Big Bang. Um, and you look for these chemical si signatures of these heavy elements and obviously what you're then trying to find is an absence of them. Right? If you can really find a star that doesn't have any of these heavy elements in it, it just has hydrogen and, and helium in it, that's a sign that this is probably a star that was made from this, this uncontaminated stuff left over from the Big Bang. I love this because it really, to me, shows to us why Messier produced his catalogue of non-comets, because he was a comet hunter. And so he wanted, kind of, wanted to have a reference set of objects, of fuzzy objects in the sky, which were no non-comets at a certain position. And so this is actually a beautiful image taken showing M92, and right next to it is a comet. Uh, this is Comet Garrard. It's actually got two tails, it's got a dust tail and an ion tail. But it shows really why Messier had to be concerned about this kind of guy so he could really find this kind of guy. It's taken light many thousands of years to get from that cluster of stars to who is here on Earth, whereas this beastie is a dirty snowball that's kind of not pretty close to the sun. So it's in a solar system, it's taken probably minutes for the light from it to get to us. He was looking for these and he had to watch out for these things because they kind of look the same.